Okay, the sutta starts as usual. Thus, oh yes, uh, this is Sangyutta Sutta. So it's, you see, it's starting with thus have I heard. So this is it means that Ananda re recited the sutta during the first council. Uh, it also means uh, hearing, listening to the sutta like now is a very important aspect of Buddhist practice. At one time, uh, here again we see this timelessness of the Dhamma. Okay? At one time, this is the time that the sutta comes back to life. That this, the, the meaning of the sutta is learned by us. And then we put purpose into it. So this is why the sutta doesn't give exact dates, because it is a practice for us. Whenever we read it, whenever we put into practice, the sutta is there. So this is not the real sutta you're looking at. The real sutta is when you have practiced it and you understand it and you feel the peace in you. Then the sutta is inside you. This is another way of putting it. At one time, the Blessed One, that means we still have our teacher, the, the, the historical Buddha. He's, this is still his time. We still remember his teaching. The Blessed One, not any other strange uh, names, but the Blessed One, the Buddha, Sakyamuni. Was wandering or peregrinating by stages. You may wonder why they are put peri peregrinating. I've used the word wandering, but this in a good sense, but people may have the wrong idea, oh, he's just wandering aimlessly. But the Buddha wanders and but it's never lost. Peregrinating gives the idea of going on a pilgrimage. So wherever he goes, it's a pilgrimage. It's, it's a mission to teach, to bring awakening, to free people from suffering. So he travels by stages. In other words, he travels a bit, say for one day, and then stops a while. When the day is too hot, maybe we'll, we'll go off the highway, sit under uh, a grove with lots of trees. Then they come to a village, they'll stay there, people will come. One reason they, they need to stop in the villages is because they, they need to collect arms in the morning. Uh, they need to strengthen themselves with food, so they only eat once a day. So their walking is what keeps them healthy. You see some of these monks really amazing, especially they may be very old, you know. Someone told me a story once, he was staying with this very old monk and he sees this, this monk's like 80 years old and he's very fit. I was wondering how did he do that? Then when the morning comes, he discovered the reason why this monk is so fit. And he's a young monk, he has to follow this old monk, he has to walk for some kilometers away to the village to collect arms. So every morning this monk does this long steady walk. So monks do exercise too. It keeps them healthy in that sense. And even the Buddha when it's not peregrinating, when it's not wandering around, in the Vihara, in, in the forest uh, hermitage, in, in, in the monastery, he would do walking. Early morning, do, do some walking. And then around sunset, just before sunset, we'll do some walking also up and down for exercise, for meditation and for exercise. Now we're given the location in Kosala country with a large community of monks. We're not told how many, but sometimes it could be 500, it could be more. So, I mean, imagine 500 monks is quite a lot. So if they come to a village, uh, this village has to feed them. So, for that, for that reason, monks are not supposed to eat too much. So, they eat just a little bit, and they do share their food anyway. So, that way they keep healthy too. And in due course, arrive at the Brahmin village of Veludwara, Bamboo Gate. Right? So, there you are. This is the introduction, telling us where the sutta was given. All right? Okay, now the Brahmin house lots of Veludwara heard. So there was already talk, you know, because people know the Buddha's approaching, okay? So there's already talk, oh, there is this famous teacher coming, right? So this is what uh, the talk is. It is said, sirs, so this one is the, the, the villagers telling the villagers, okay? It is said, sirs, that the recluse Gotama, a Sakya son, who went forth from the Sakya clan, has been wandering in Kosala 
with a large community of monks and has come to Vedadwara. So they already know, they already heard about the Buddha. So they're very happy the Buddha is coming to their village. Concerning this blessed one, the, this fair report has been spread about, right? So uh, this is what's called a stock passage where uh, the reflection ATP so Bhagavan is, is given to show that they know the Buddha very well, or at least by reputation. So it is too, he is the blessed one, for he is Arahat, fully self-awakened one, accomplished in wisdom and conduct, welfarer, knower of worlds, peerless guide of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, awakened, blessed. So this, this gives the idea that he is the Buddha, the awakened one, not any ordinary teacher or guru. Right? Then in the next section, uh, the Dharma is highlighted. Okay? So first the Buddha is highlighted, then the Dharma is highlighted. Having realized by his own direct knowledge, and this is very important, the Buddha discovered this truth. This, the, the Dharma means the truth. The liberating truth. He discovered it himself by his own direct knowledge, his practice, his meditation. This world with its gods, its maras and brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its rulers and people, he makes it known to others. So here, th this long passage is a way of saying that the Buddha has declared his teachings, not just to humans, but also to the gods. Now, you have difficulty believing in gods. None of us have seen any gods, or we, we think we have. We, we can think of them as like aliens, okay? And, and so they, they do come to see the Buddha, it seems, right? So the Buddha's knowledge is quite beyond ours. So, and Mara, this, sometimes the trans translation is just Mara and Brahma. So, Mara here will refer to the you can say the chief distractor, the one who's always trying to distract us whenever we want to do something good. It's our own mind, really. And Brahma is this uh, high god, if you like. The, in, in the Brahma world, he, he has done some deep meditation. So he is like always concerned with this world. And he's not the creator or anything like that. He, he's just like, because of his good karma, he has become this chief of a, a god of a higher level, on a meditative level, the form world. Sakra is lot of the devas in the sense world, okay? and then this generation with recluses and brahmins. In India, in the Buddha's time, there were recluses like the Buddha and, and there were the brahmins. These are the two big classes in India at that time, okay? the, the classes of religious people. And then there were the kings and the people. So the Buddha teaches to all these people. He teaches the Dharma good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. Good in the beginning because of moral virtue. Good in the end, uh, good in the middle is uh, meditation, mindfulness. And good in the end is wisdom. It, there is wisdom in this teaching, both in the spirit and in the letter. So this is the Buddha's way of teaching. Like here, as we look at the sutta, you can say this is the letter. Sometimes the Buddha will use metaphors, will use stories, sometimes he even use word plays. So that would say in the spirit, okay? So in the spirit and in the letter. So that's the Dharma for lay people, if you like. He proclaims the holy life that is entirely complete and pure. Okay, this holy life. Uh, you can see there's two parts. First is for the lay people, the five precepts. Then you have the the complete training for the monks with more precepts, the vinaya, complete and pure. Everything is there. A pure here meaning to clear the minds of views and impurities. So having said this, they're very happy. They say it is indeed good to see, su see such arahats. Notice this is plural arahats, no. Uh, the Buddha is an arahat, and there are others, many who are also arahats following the Buddha. So, arahat here means worthy one, worthy of our respect because he is already awakened by himself, and they are pure, purified of all defilements. So, these are the arahats. Sometimes pronounced as arahant, okay? And in Chinese, you get lohan, okay? So, now, what, what do the people of the village do? Section 3. Then the Brahmin house lords, so they are house lords, in other words, they, 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 all, they have their 
plot of land and, and they have their houses and, and probably some land also. So they live together and they're all Brahmins. Approach the Blessed One. So it, it seems that probably they, they maybe they invited the Buddha to the village or, or the Buddha came to a, in, the Buddha normally would not stay in a crowded place like a town or in a village itself, be too noisy and distracting. The Buddha would stay just outside in a quiet place, in a grove, in a park. And these villagers, they will go. So it's very interesting to see them, you know, going there, probably uh, when the sun is, is just setting. And there'll be lights, of course, where, where the Buddha is. And if it's a full moon day, it will be really bright and beautiful. So they approached the Buddha. Now this part is very interesting. I just want you to notice the sequence of how these people greeted the Buddha. To show, uh, there's a little bit of humor here actually. Having approached, some greeted the Blessed One and sat down at one side. So they put their palms together, they bow and then they sit down quietly. Some exchanged greetings with the Blessed One and then sat down at one side. So they come to the Buddha and they say welcome or uh, just uh, some polite words. Some, having saluted the Blessed One with lotus palms, sat down at one side. So the, the, the first group just kind of say hello and hi. You know? So the, this people, third group, they're very respectful. They put their palms together, lotus palms, palms together, and they bow to the Buddha. Okay. This is a kind of universal practice in uh, uh, what they call East Asia, if you like, South Asia, East Asia. So they bow to the Buddha in respect. So they have a bit more, they feel more connected with the Buddha. Now then you have another group. Some announce their name and, and clan before the Blessed One and then sit down at one side. So these people probably, they are important families, so they uh, kind of introduce themselves, they feel polite to do so, and then they go before the Buddha. All right? Now then the last line is very interesting. Look at this last line. Some kept silent and sat down at one side. So some just come quietly, just sit down. Maybe they came quite un unwillingly. You see, because the whole village would go and see the Buddha. So if you want to stay in the village, there's nothing to do. So they just kind of drag their legs and come along. Okay, maybe they're not religious or maybe they are young kids, young children perhaps. But anyway, here we see this rare occasion when this group which is silent is mentioned. All right? So quite a, an array of audience that the Buddha is having. Now the teaching, I mean, if you come to see the Buddha, what do you do? You don't talk about roti prata or, or, or there's no football there. You don't gossip, you see. You only talk, listen to Dharma, all right? Okay, section four. Sitting thus at one side, the Brahmin house lords of Veludwara said to the Blessed One, now notice here, when you read suttas, you, you must not be too uh, word-oriented. Here the sutta says, Brahmin house lots of Veludwara. It doesn't mean only the house lots came. Their family also would come along. Okay. So these Brahmin house lots, they, they, they said to the Blessed One, Master Gotama, we have such desires, such, such wishes, such hopes. May we dwell in the home crowded with children, right? So they say, okay, okay we're like this, we're quite worldly, you know. Uh, we love our family and children. We love having a house and so on. May we enjoy Kasi sandalwood, all right? So they say they, they like to use this very fragrant sandalwood. Today you say maybe per, uh, perfume from Paris, if you like. Okay, so, uh, Kasi is far away, so this is imported sandalwood, right? So they're basically saying, oh, you know, we, we love using all this perfume and so on. May we wear garlands, sands, and makeup, right? So they, they like to deck themselves, beautify themselves. May we enjoy gold and silver. So in other words, uh, they, they use money also, right? So they, they uh, basically lay people. And then finally, they say, when the body breaks up after death, may we be reborn in a good destination, in a heavenly world. Right? So they did, did not say, may we attain nirvana, okay? And they have not heard of the Dharma before from the Buddha, I suppose. Right? But they say, we just want to be reborn happily. 
you know, in, in, in a heavenly world, perhaps, right? So the, those are they tell the Buddha, do you have something to teach us, you know, something in, in this way? So basically, they, they, they are telling the Buddha, we don't, we're not going to become monks, you know, so we want to have, do you have a teaching especially for us, who are lay people? The Buddha is, of course, ready. So the Buddha gives them a special teaching. Look at section 5. I will teach you, house lords, a Dharma teaching for self-application. Listen, pay close attention, I will speak. Right. So, uh, a Dharma teaching for self-application. You practice it yourself. You, no one else can practice it for you. This is, in a, in a way, the essence of Buddhism in those days. The Brahmins just the opposite. The Brahmins say, we will pray for you. Bring your donations, bring your offerings, and we will pray for you. You don't know the chance. We, only we know the chance. But the, the Buddha belongs to the, what's called the recluse group, the Samanas. They empower the people. They empower us. The Buddha empowers us to practice on our own, to self-help. Okay? Then, the, of course, the Brahmin house lords reply, Yes, yes, sir. So they use the word sir here. Okay? So they're not Buddhists yet, they say. So they're Brahmins, they always use the word bo, meaning sir. Okay? So it's a, it's a polite kind of uh, response. Today, in, in, in the local culture, it'll be like tuan. Okay? Yes, sir, the Brahmin house lords of Iludwara reply, In essence, to the Blessed One. The Blessed One said, what householder is this Dharma teaching for self-application? Okay, now the teaching starts. This is the one that we want to learn. Now you notice that B, section B says training for body and speech. Right? And you can see brackets 1. If you like, you can have a quick look. Where's number 2? You might wonder. Okay, and then 2 on the next page says respect for the not given. And 3, respect for the body. And number 4, respect for truth and then later I'll, I'll tell you about the, the remaining section five onwards okay let's go back to one respect for life uh, this uh, subtitle has been added in by the translator so this is where the Sutta Discovery series helps us to uh, have a better idea to divide up this, this Sutta so that's easier to digest Section 6. Here, house lord, a noble disciple reflects thus. Now, notice the Buddha uses the word a noble disciple. The Buddha is, in other words, telling the people of Eludwara, if you want to be a true disciple, you'll be a noble disciple. Then you should reflect in this way. Or just think of this. So the Buddha is using something they already know. The Buddha said, just think of this. I am one who wishes to live, who does not wish to die, who desires happiness, who dislikes suffering. Since I am, I am one who, has, uh, who wishes to live and does not wish to die, who desires happiness and dislikes suffering, if someone were to take my life, that would be neither desirable nor agreeable to me. Right? So the Buddha starts with something everybody knows, so to speak, from something known to the unknown. If I see the Buddha is asking, do you agree? We all love life, from what the house lords of Uelidwara have said. They want to live luxuriously, happily with children and go to heaven. So you all value life, right? Because no one disagrees. So the Buddha starts there. Now, using that as the premise, the Buddha goes to the next point, 6.2. Now, if I were to take the life of another, of one who wishes to live, who does not wish to die, who wishes happiness, who dislikes suffering, that would be neither desirable nor agreeable to him too. So here, very simple logic. The Buddha says, okay, you love life. Other people also feel the same way. So if you hurt them or take away their life, they won't be too happy. There are others who are living who won't be too happy. Now, what is undesirable and disagreeable to me is undesirable and disagreeable to others too. 
So here the Buddha is showing the universality of this truth. It's not something, it's not a private teaching. Right? This feeling, this love of life is common to all. Indeed, what is undesirable and disagreeable to me is also the same to others too. How can I inflict upon another what is undesirable and disagreeable to me? Right? So, this is the very nicely stated, very clearly, very simple language the Buddha shows to the people of Veludwara why life is precious. This is called the value of life. This is the what underlies the first precept. So, what must we do? So here's where, okay, before this, we, it's, what, it's called the golden rule. This is the golden rule, and I think this is one, one of the only religious texts that actually fully explain what the golden rule is in detail. This is the passage, the golden rule. Okay, Do not do unto others what you do not want others to do unto you. And the positive aspect, do unto others what you want them to do unto you. So, what is it? There is this threefold purity of bodily conduct. So how do we practice this first precept? He himself abstains from destroying life. This is the first precept, right? Then, not only that, you not only keep the precept yourself, you also encourage others not to do it. Your children, your family, your friends, relatives. He exhorts others to abstain, to abstain from destroying life. And he speaks in praise of abstaining from destroying life life. So these are called the three, uh, threefold purity of the practice of the precepts, right? In other words, just keeping the first precepts is not enough, right? You also should encourage others in a gentle way, of course, in a happy way, by example, to do the same. And when they do it, say, wow, this is wonderful, and to praise, make them feel happy. Thus, his bodily conduct is purified in three respects. So these are your precept is completely practiced. So there you are, this is the how the first precept is practiced. If someone asks you, why mommy or why daddy do we practice the precepts? This is the one you can retell. Even a young, intelligent young child can understand this wonderful, simple logic. Now we have caught the snake by the head, so to speak, right? So this is the key number one paragraph you must understand. Once you understand that, then number two is very easy. All right, so number two, respect for the not given. Okay. Uh, further, house lots, a noble disciple reflects thus. If someone were to take from me what I have not given, that is to steal from me, that would be neither desirable nor agreeable to me. Right. So here again, the same logic. Right. Now, if I were to take from another what he, what he has not given, that is to steal from him, that would be neither desirable nor agreeable to him too, right? So the feeling is mutual, right? I feel the same way too. If someone were to steal from me, I wouldn't be happy. So others feel in the same way. In fact, this is the very similar way of logic used by a very famous European uh, philosopher called Immanuel Kant. He says, well, if everybody stole, then nobody will work. Then there'll be no peace and progress, right? So this is another way of philosophically to put it. So the Buddha says, well, if you understand that you do not like people to steal from you, you should not steal from others. So this is the proper way to practice. Then the Buddha summarizes his teaching and give, by way of the threefold purity of bodily conduct. Here the bodily conduct is not to steal. All right? Having reflected thus, he himself abstains from taking the not given. He exhorts others to abstain from taking the not given. He speaks in praise of abstaining from taking the not given. Right? So we practice the second precept of not stealing. Then we encourage others also to be honest, not to steal. And then we praise when the action is done. Okay, so second rationale for the second precept. Okay? Now, we've been talking about value. Okay? First one is very clear, is value of life. In the second precept, the value is happiness. Now, this is not exactly taught in the suttas because it's taken for granted. I spent many, many years when I was much younger reflecting on why the five precepts are arranged in this way, one to five. The first is very clear. The value is that of life. Okay? Now, imagine there is life. 
but life alone is not enough. I mean, even a frog, a, a mosquito has life. As humans, there's something else about life. We want happiness. What is it that makes us happy? We work for money, for service, for help. Then we save this money so that we can buy things, support ourselves, support our family, have a nice, comfortable home. We are happy. So when we have income, we are happy. We rightly earn it. But if someone else takes this away, then it takes, he also takes away our happiness. That is why you can see this second precept is founded, rooted in the value of happiness. Okay. Now we come to the third precept. Respect for the body. Further house lords, a noble disciple reflects thus. If someone were to have affairs with my women folk, that would be neither desirable nor agreeable to me. Now, if I were to have affairs with the women folk of others, that would be neither desirable nor agreeable to him too, or to, uh, to them too. Eh? So, here is a general explanation of the third precept. The third precept is Kami Su Mechachara Viramani Sikapadang Samadhyami Not to have sexual misconduct. Right? So here, basically, the Buddha is saying we should not uh, violate the women of others, their wives, their daughters, their children, in other words. Now you may wonder why it is the, the women who are mentioned but not the men. Well, you look at India today, you, you understand why. The, the men are the, the ones who regard themselves as the, like the, the Lord, if you like. It's a very patriarchal society, even in China. You know? This is the old society. So the women, in other words, need protection. So here, if you are a feminist, you can see this as a very beautiful, uh, caring statement by the Buddha that the women should be protected. So, they, in in a sense, this third precepts to protect women too, right? So, the argument is, you don't want people to disturb your women, so do not disturb the women of others. But of course, today we broaden this teaching, the spirit of this. I will tell you why this uh, this should be done in a moment. Let me just finish this part first. So here the Buddha says, how do we complete this practice? Threefold purity of bodily conduct. So here we have the first three precepts against killing, stealing, such misconduct. They are broken to the body. So we, we purify our body by not breaking these three precepts. By not doing. It's very interesting, isn't it? Having reflected thus, he himself abstains from sexual misconduct. Notice here, sexual misconduct is mentioned very clearly. Alright? Kame su mechachara. He exhorts others to abstain, abstain from sexual misconduct, and he speaks in praise of abstaining from sexual misconduct. Alright? So here you are. This, in this section, the precept is taught more broadly. When the Buddha was speaking to the Velu Dwara villagers, he was kind of specially mentioned the women, so respect your women. Okay? Whereas in this last section, in the, this triad of sentences, the threefold purity, it's as if the Buddha is talking to the, the future, to us. So, for our practice, we are talking about such a misconduct in general should be avoided. Respect for the body, respect for others. Okay, so the if you like, you can say the value here is that of respect for others, or even freedom from others for others, if you like, freedom to say no. Okay, in other words, it is very beautiful. You know, in some religions. The wife is like chattel to the man, or at least the, the wife has to obey the, the husband. But in, in the case of a Buddhist couple, they are equal, so to speak. In other words, here a man cannot demand of the wife and say, You are my wife, so I can have sex with you anytime. If I want it, you must give it to me. The wife can say, Oh no, 
uh, I, I don't feel like doing it tonight. And the husband has to respect her. And this is amazing. That I find very rare. I've not seen in other uh, religious teachings we have this kind of statement. So here again you see this feminist kind of teaching where the woman is given equal status as the man in terms of personal conduct, even within the privacy of their marriage. Something worth reflecting on. Okay, so uh, I've spoken to you about the universal aspect of this here. Okay, now we come to the next one. Okay, so here instead of the here we have the fourth precept. Okay, but the fourth precept is broken up in detail into the four right speeches. So there are four here, four right speeches. Let's look at. Brackets 5, respect for harmony. Section 10. Furthermore, uh, wait, have I done not done false speech? Eh? Okay, let's go back a bit to number 4. Number 9, bracket, brackets 4, num then number 9. Further, house lots, a house, a noble disciple reflects thus. If someone were to damage my welfare with false speech, it, that would not, that would be neither desirable nor agreeable to me. And then the same thing, if, if uh, it, it would not be good for someone else to speak uh, falsely about about me too, right? So if we uh, want others to respect us, to be kind to us, we should also be kind to them. If you want others to not to spread rumors about us, we should not. Also, we should not do the same for others too. So this, there is this mutuality of uh, good conduct here. And this is quite clear. So the, uh, let's go into the threefold purity of verbal conduct. Having reflected thus, he himself abstains from false speech. He exhorts others to abstain from false speech. He speaks in praise of abstaining from false speech. So this is a complete practice of the the the. the fourth precept uh, uh, as far as we have it when we recited it but here you have three more aspects okay respect for harmony so here section 10 furthermore house lords a noble disciple reflects thus if someone were to divide me from my friends with divisive speech that would be neither desirable nor agreeable to me right so this is uh, breaking people up through slander, bringing a story from the other side to this side, say, oh, the other side talk bad about you, and then bring a story from here to the other side, and these friends become enemies through listening to gossip, right? So if we do not want others to do this to us, we, we should also not do this to others, right? This is quite clear. So this is the golden rule. Okay, so now we go on to the three, four purity, Having reflected thus, he himself abstains from divisive speech. He exhorts others to abstain from divisive speech, and he speaks in praise of abstaining from divisive speech. Thus, his verbal conduct is purified in three respects. So this is speech which breaks up people, should not be done. So that is a second right speech to practice. Now the third right speech, Respect for proper speech. Furthermore, house lords or noble disciple reflects thus. If someone were to address me with harsh speech, violent words, you know, that would be neither desirable nor agreeable to me. But I don't like someone to speak rudely to me, right? So we too should not do that to others. We should use pleasant speech, right? You find in the Eightfold Path, the word used is pleasant speech. The, the positive aspect of it. Right? So here again this is very clear. The triple purity. He we ourselves should abstain from harsh speech. We should encourage others to abstain from harsh speech. And we praise those who practice pleasant speech. Right? Especially with children. We we train our children, those who are in our church in this way. Okay? To start young it's easier. Then, number seven, respect for useful speech. So here you are, we have 
number one is the truth. Number two is uh, unifying speech. Number three is pleasant speech. And here number four, what is this speech that's to be avoided? Furthermore, house lots, the noble disciple reflects thus. If someone were to address me with frivolous talk and idle chatter, that would be neither desirable nor agreeable to me. Anyway, this should be the case. All right? There might be some people say, oh, I love idle chatter. Well, that's wrong. Okay, so here, the sutta says, so we should be, this should be avoided because there is a rationale behind it. It's not just the sutta says so, but there is this reasoning. Because if others were to do this, we won't be happy. Right? We find wasting time and uh, the work be affected and so on. Right? So useful talk is very important. Of course, this doesn't mean we cannot, like, you know, uh, talk lightly with one another within limits. Okay, we are always happy with people who make us laugh, tell us stories and so on. But frivolous talk is different. Frivolous talk is something that's not very useful at all. It's gossip. It's going to cause lots of problems and difficulties in due course. So here, same thing, that the three, threefold purity, we should practice this ourselves speak useful talk, exhort others to do the same, useful talk, right? And then speak in praise of those who do the same. Now we come to number eight. So, okay, there's no eight, <laughs> it's only seven. So these are the seven, uh, it's almost like the seven precepts, if you like, although four precepts are mentioned, but if you actually in terms of the five precepts, only four are mentioned here. The fifth that is on the uh, against drinking is not mentioned, but it's mentioned in the elsewhere in the Sikhata Vada Sutta. Uh, all right, now you look at the next one, you have brackets one, two, three again, section 13 onwards. So this, the Buddha has finished teaching the people of the village about keeping the precepts. So now the Buddha goes on to mental training. Now what's interesting here is not just mental training, this uh, talking about the, the three jewels is also part of the becoming a stream winner. So this is a kind of, if you like, it's kind of a hidden teaching, a, a special gift in, a wrapped in Dharma, okay, for the people. There are three jewels and then there's something in number four, which we'll come to in a moment. Let's look at section 13. He has wise faith in the Buddha. Notice wise faith, not mere faith. Wise faith in the Buddha thus. So too is he the Blessed One. Okay. Right, so you, we are advised to reflect. Why is it that we look up to the Buddha? He is Arahat. He is worthy of his status as Buddha. There's only one Buddha. He's awakened, fully self-awakened one. He himself practiced. He himself awakened. Right? Accomplished in wisdom and conduct. His knowledge, his wisdom is also shown in his practice, in his conduct. He's a welfarer. Wherever he goes, he brings peace and joy and blessings. Knower of worlds. You can talk a lot about this, but let's keep it simple. Of course, the, the most uh, people who, who like simple Buddhism say, Oh, this uh, Buddha knows all, the, he knows the three worlds. He knows the sense world, that's the world we are living in, the physical universe. Then the form world, which is a jhana world. And then the formless world, where these beings are pure energy. You don't see them. The Buddha knows about all these worlds. But there's another deeper meaning. The world here refers to all that there is, the all, through the five aggregates, okay? Form, feeling, perception, formation, consciousness, okay? Which can be experienced through our eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, okay? And also the mind's number six. So the world are these, the five physical senses. That's all there is, plus the mind, says the Buddha. That's all there is you can know, that's all there is to know. So that's the world, right? 
No one else has taught this. So in this sense, the Buddha is knower of the worlds. This is found in the Sabha Sutta. Sabha Sutta. Peerless of guidance person, of persons to be tamed. The Buddha is very good. He's an expert in training people. He could even calm and convert the serial killer, the bandit Angulimala. Teacher of gods and humans. Now this is quite a, a, a tricky one. Eh? Because we know the Buddha teaches human beings. But here, is also mentioned as teaching the gods, the angels, or whatever you like to call them. So here I imagine, a bit futuristic here, I imagine these aliens coming and the Buddha is teaching them too. Now, of course, we all watch all these uh, Star Wars movies, Star Trek and so on. Imagine if aliens were to come, this is the next kind of uh, exploration, you know. Let's say aliens are able to visit us and we are able to travel to space and go to other universes. And they're going to ask about religion. Wouldn't it be strange if they, if someone would teach them, oh, you know, we, we believe in a certain religion, uh, this God created our world and so on. And the alien say, oh, that's interesting. Or would the alien be feel more connected when the Buddha talks about everything is impermanent, suffering, non-self? Say, oh, we can see that in our world too, in another part of the universe, right? So you see here, the Buddha's teaching is very universal. It can apply in anywhere in the universe, unlike other God religions, for example, right? So it's as if the Buddha was is very experienced. He has seen this whole universe. And for that reason, we say he is awakened. That's the next one, awakened, Buddha. Yeah? So he, he understands all this. And he is blessed. Notice this is the last of the nine virtues of the Buddha. It's a blessing that we know him. We become happy. This is indirectly pointing to Nirvana. Right, there you are. So the Buddha said, this is what you should do. Have faith in the Buddha. Okay? All right. Now it's nine o'clock. So I'll take a break. Short while, then we'll go on to the next section. Okay? Okay. Thank you, Brother Pia. We shall take a five minutes break now. Right, let's continue. Faith in the Dhamma. Section 14. He has wise faith. Notice wise faith again is mentioned here, not blind faith. Wise faith, that means investigate. And if you are not certain, you say, okay, I'll hold on with this first. You don't have to deny it, see? but you say, I'll hold on, hold on with this first. Okay. He has wise faith in the Dhamma, the true teaching. Thus, so this is a reflection on the virtues of the, the Dharma. Well taught is the Blessed One's Dharma. So the Buddha taught it very carefully, very systematically. Visible here and now. For example, you're listening to it and you can feel the peace inside you. And you go on higher into meditation. Again, you can experience it here and now. It's not about something in the future. Okay? Now the next one is quite profound. Having nothing to do with time. Akaliko. Okay? Now, when you meditate, you know you find if you do a very, you have a very good meditation, time seems to fly, right? Or on the other hand, like now when I look back, I say, "Well, I've been working for like uh, twenty years now, nineteen years to be exact, and I've done so many suttas." You know? So I never thought of it when I first started with it. So it, it's amazing how time has flown, but there's so much done. So it's like time doesn't really matter to us if you really want to practice Dhamma. And notice here, even with this study now, we are more than halfway over the study already. Right? But of course, when we talk about the Dhamma, it is something timeless. It is something is true in the past, present and future. Inviting one to come and see Ehi Pasiko you are invited to investigate for yourself. There's nothing to be forced on you. Accessible. You can go directly by your own practice. No need of priests or even monks. You practice it yourself. The monks are teachers who guide us. To be personally known by the wise. So you need to be to have some wisdom. And we're not born with wisdom, but 
we cultivate it through listening to the suttas, putting things together, then we personally understand the Buddha's teaching. Now this last aspect is becoming lost to us as we follow the later teachings where they say, oh, you just do this prayer, you just chant this parita, or you just transfer merits. That's enough, you know, and you don't have to do anything else, right? But the Buddha teaches us personally known. Our involvement in good is very important. You yourself can do it. If you yourself don't do it, who can, is there's no one else who can do it for you, right? So there you are. This is the reflection on the Dhamma. Then the Sangha. Brackets 3, section 15. He has wise faith in the Sangha thus. The Blessed One's community of disciples keeps to the good way. Okay, here we have this. Uh, notice who is mentioned here. The Blessed One's community of disciples. Disciples, Savaka. Savaka refers to those who are already saints, stream winners, once returners, non returners, arahats. They keep to the good way. They practice the Vinaya, the Dhamma. The Blessed One's community of disciples keep to the straight way, Uju Patipano, straight way. Here, straight way means uh, the, the mind goes into meditation and, and goes straight to uh, uh, Samadhi, okay? To focus, that's one way of understanding it. Straight way also means it keeps the precepts, like, like the one before. One builds on the other, okay? The Blessed One's community of disciples keeps to the right way, Uju Patipano, okay? Here refers, uh, sorry, Nyaya Patipano. Here refers to the Eightfold Path. They go to the training of Sila, Samadhi, Panya. Okay. As long as they're not Arahats, they go to the real training, the higher training of moral virtue, um, uh, mindfulness, or concentration, and wisdom. The Blessed One's community of disciples keeps to the proper way. So they respect the teaching, they respect uh, their disciples, and they respect the training. So they keep it the proper way with respect. These are the four pairs of persons. The four persons are, four individuals are the stream winner, once returner, non-returner, arahats. Then they, they are, each are divided into two, like uh, undergraduate, graduate, okay? The stream winner to be, the stream winner become, full full fledged stream winner, and so on. So two times four, these are called the eight individuals. Are this blessed ones community of disciples? So very clearly we know here this refers to the saints. They are worthy of offerings. Okay, so here we normally make offerings to gods and spirits, but you don't really get anything from that. But when you give to the monks. The, the nuns and the novices who, who really keep to the, the precepts and who are saints, and it's really wonderful. Worthy of hospitality, when they come to our houses to collect arms in the morning, that we respect them, we welcome them. They're worthy of gifts. Here, the Pali word is Dakina, Dakineyo. Here, refers to, uh, traditionally, the gifts here refers to honorariums given to teachers. Okay, Teachers who teach us, we give them a donation. So here, this kind of offering is also worthy to be given to the monks. Not money in this case, by the way, offering of food. Okay. Worthy of salutation with the lotus palms, okay, Anjali. Okay. So it's worthy of showing them public respect. Why? Because they are a supreme field of merit for the world. You want to gain happiness? You want to prepare yourself for the good karma for future happiness, even awakening. It is good to show your respect to this holy community of disciples. Now, so these are the three jewels, recollecting the three jewels. Then comes the fourth one. This is the last teaching the Buddha has given them. Accomplishment in moral virtue. He has the virtues dear to the noble ones, unbroken, untorn, unblemished, untarnished, liberating, praised by the wise, 
untarnish, leading to mental concentration. So the Buddha closes the teaching this this uh, nearing the end by reminding the people of Veludwara to keep the precepts. Okay, make sure the precepts are totally kept, unbroken, untorn. This is a cloth parable, cloth uh, metaphor. The, like good cloth is not broken, nothing is torn, so the precepts are kept complete and whole. Unblemished, untarnished. Yeah? Uh, here we can also translate as uh, unmixed or spotless. So this is a parable from, from a cow. A cow which is the, the, the color is unmixed, pure white. Okay? It's a very beautiful cow, very precious. And uh, spotless. Right. So when we keep the precepts well, we are also like that. We are spotless, we are pure. Okay? And this will liberate us and not, uh, of wrong views. And notice the last phrase, leading to mental concentration. So there is a reason why we keep the precepts. This is to build up the good karma, to clear our minds of defilements and views so that we can meditate better. So mental concentration. All right? Now the Buddha says, if you practice all this, this is the benefit. Now what's interesting, the Buddha never mentioned, oh, well he did mention, sorry, he did mention stream winning in the end. Okay? But let's look at section 17. When house lords, the noble disciple has these seven virtues, seven virtuous qualities that the uh, one to seven mentioned regarding the precepts, that is the uh, three precepts of body and then the four right speeches, you know, seven. And these four desirable states, that is the three refuges plus the pure precepts, then he could by himself declare of himself, destroy this hell for me, no more hell, no more animal birth. Destroy is the realm of the departed, the, the Preta realm. Destroy is the plane of misery, the born or destiny, the, the lower realm, no more suffering states. A stream winner am I, no longer bound for the lower world, sure of going over to self-awakening. Now notice here, this last paragraph, the Buddha is telling the people of Baludwareya who are Brahmins or not yet Buddhists, they can be stream winners. Now, I'm telling you who are Buddhists, you can be stream winners in the spirit of this Sutta itself. If it is so for the people of Baludwareya, it is even more true for us today. So the Sutta is also reminding us, find out more about what is stream winning. Aspire to be stream winners in this life. When you aspire, then you will gain the path. Definitely by the end of life, if not within this life itself. That is in the Chaku, uh, Anicca Chaku Sutta. So the Sutta comes to an end with the people of Veladwara saying sadhu, ne? section 18. When this was said, the Brahmin house lords of Veludwara said to the Blessed One, Excellent Master Gautama, Excellent Master Gautama, just as one were to place upright what had been overturned, in other words, making, showing what's wrong and then showing the right, what to, were to reveal what was hidden. They did not know many of these things before, now they know but to show the way to one who was lost, right? So now they know the way. But to hold up a lamp in the dark so that those with eyes could see forms. In the same way, in numerous ways, has the Dhamma been made known by Master Gotama. So they take refuge now. We go to the Blessed Gotama for refuge, to the Dhamma and to the community of monks. May Master Gotama remember us as lay followers who have gone for refuge from this day forth for life. So here the Buddha has converted these people. Yeah? And uh, notice they, they are Brahmins, so they still address the Buddha by name. They call him Master Gotama. Right? So this is a normal way the Brahmins were taught. Now, what, there's something interesting here which I've been pondering of for many years, and, and uh, last week I thought about it. The, it is clear to me now, let me explain to you why 
the third precept here is the community of monks. He doesn't just say Sangha, it's a community of monks. It doesn't say the disciples. It'd be rather strange if uh, here the Sutta would mean simply the monks, including conventional monks. This would be against the previous uh, section on the, the Noble Sangha. Here, when we look at the word uh, bhikkhu, it has, we must look at it in the deeper meaning. Who is a bhikkhu? Now, the commentary has explained the word bhikkhu, the etymology, in two ways. Bhikkhako ti bhikkhu, meaning the one who lives on arms is a bhikkhu, he's a monk. Then there's, there's, there's the verb form of the etymology, bhikkhati ti bhikkhu, the one who eats arms, one who takes arms. Actually, both these etymologies have the same meaning. So in other words, the Buddha is saying, those who live on arms, the Buddha is referring to renunciation. So here, in other words, the community of monk refers to renunciation. That is something we must remember. This is the spirit of the Buddha's teaching in practice. When we keep precepts, what do we renounce? We renounce killing. We renounce killing, uh, stealing. We renounce sexual misconduct. We renounce false speech. We renounce a clouded mind. Then when we practice meditation, what do we renounce? We renounce lack of clarity of the mind, we renounce wrong views, we renounce defilements. So step by step we renounce, we let go of what is not useful, what is negative, what is harmful to us. So our whole practice is, even as lay people, is that of renunciation. So there you are. The sutta is complete. And in case you want to know more about the precepts, I will, let me recommend you to read Sila Anusati, the paper entitled Sila Anusati, Recollection on the Precepts, ST 15.11. ST 15.11. You can message me later, anytime that you want this paper, I'll send it to you. Okay, now I've finished my part. Let us go on to the question. Thank you very answers. much. Thank you very much, Brother Pia. Thank you for the explanation of the sutta. We will now move on to the um, question and answer session. First of all, uh, can we call Sister Noel Lim from KL to ask her question? Sister Noel? Hi. Hi. Yeah, hi. Yes, hello. Hi. I hi. have questions. Yeah, please. Uh, why is this your favorite sutta? Well, because very, as I mentioned earlier, it's very simple and it's very comprehensive, especially for lay practice. Mm. So for that reason, it's very easy for me just to quote the sutta, explain to people, uh, what does Buddhism teach? How do I practice it? And that answers practically everything, you know? Yeah. And so because my understanding about Brahmins are like they are at the higher uh, level, yes. I was wondering why did he choose something uh, simplified for okay. the Brahmins? community. Let me answer that first. Eh? It's a very interesting question. Okay, we must not think of the Brahmins as a uniform uh, group, you see, because the Buddha was living in a time when uh, it, it, there was this uh, intellectual turmoil. People were thinking and rethinking, you know, very much like modern Singapore, like, you know, uh, in our modern world, people have, have the freedom to think, freedom to choose. So not all Brahmins are the upper class, uh, bombastic and, and selfish uh, priests, you know. There are also even among the Brahmins who do not like the system and they are very intelligent people. And there are also poor Brahmins, you must remember. And remember these are Brahmin, they are living in a village on their own. So they are not the high class uh, Brahmin in the city, serving the kings and so on. The Brahmins are usually well educated, intelligent, so the Buddha could teach them directly. That is why he gave them this very complete teaching. Okay? okay. And then second question, how do you know you are at a stream winning stage? Alright, this is quite tough because I can't say I'm a stream winner yet. But basically, from what I've learned, 
you know when when you're eating you know you are full you I may take some time but you know you're full right uh, or when you're hungry you know you're hungry so streaming is a little bit more tricky it's like you have passed your exam you have passed your exam it is very difficult for you to tell me okay right now this moment at such such a time exactly I've passed my exam you won't know you have completed your papers everything you go home and wait for the results at best we can say when you see the result out on the notice board and, and the moment you read your names ah oh, I've passed okay that moment can be officially regarded as you have passed but then again it's quite tricky isn't it maybe the, when the examiner put the last pass on your paper that could be regarded as a time you have passed you see so it's very difficult to actually pinpoint the exact moment but you will know through what's called uh, review knowledge after living this life of peace and so on you look back you say oh okay i've been keeping the precepts i've not been breaking it i have great faith in the three jewels uh, and and i'm happy and so on and then you that's why you need the suttas you need to understand what the suttas is teaching then you look at it you say okay looks like i'm a stream winner now the thing about being a stream winner is we don't go around telling people it's not a status it's a state in other words you you go to a transformation a change so it is not something conferred to you by someone else you win it yourself so this is one of the way of looking at it you know you are free from a sickness you know you have recovered from a, a disease something like that okay all right thank you thank you sister Noel. Thank you, Brother Pia. Um, next, can we have uh, Brother Love all the way from UAE to ask the question? Brother Love? Uh, uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, like, uh, if suppose a person has stolen from a, a, a like a Putu Jana, a stream enterer, or mm -hmm. one stream, an Arahat, like, how will they feel? Like, uh, will a Arahat also also feel like uh, maybe unpleasant but maybe he'll not crave regarding that so what are the difference in how they will feel okay let me be clear you're, t you're saying if someone steals from an arahat is it like uh, if someone steals from uh, like uh, one person steals from a putu jana oh. person steals from a mm -hmm. stream mm -hmm. steals from a one sitana uh, the, one the stealing steals from an arahat. The, the stealing whether it's from an ordinary person or from a saint it's still stealing that uh, no, I'm just saying, uh, how will the people who have been stolen from, like, oh, how, how they feel? Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, as you know, if it's a, world, a worldly person, the person, if he knows it, he'll be unhappy, right? That one is quite quite sure. Eh? We don't have to say yeah. much about that. But for the Arahad, I, I don't think he will be bothered at all because he, has, he owns nothing. Uh, what is technically regarded as his would be his robes, his bow, and the eight things you know like his razor and then the needle and thread uh, his belt and so on so th there were stories that you know monks and they are, even their ropes got stolen and then they, they have to go to the village and ask for for help so they they will never react in a negative way because they already awaken but uh, will uh, will there be like an unpleasant uh, vedna arising for for whom for the person who stole uh, no for the arahat if he's uh, someone stole from a villain no of course not of course not no because uh, but, uh, he still has a pleasant and unpleasant and neutral way now, right he would not think my from my understanding of the suttas he would not think anything of it okay. Okay, there, there is this uh, some stories uh, which put a little humor onto this arahat there's a story where uh, this this is not from India, it's from some other source where this Allah is meditating in his in his tent and then uh, this poor man uh, this man comes along and uh, asks for his help, says he's hungry and, and, and uh, this Allah monk says, okay, here's some food in my bowl, you can finish it, you know and this monk only got his robe, his bowl and uh, then uh, at night the monk was sleeping and then this ungrateful man stole uh, the, the 
what they call the Mang Soup Bowl and, and ran off. So, so this Mang got up and <laughs> he ran after the team and said, uh, come, come, I, I know you need all this, so why don't you take my ropes too? <laughs> gave his ropes also, you know. <laughs> well, it's a story of ultimate renunciation, okay? So, uh, the Buddha, the monks wouldn't bother about this. And the most important thing is, they do not own property. I mean, the, the, the good monks and nuns, they are hard, you see? So, the, the question doesn't arise, there's nothing to steal from them, actually. <laughs> okay? Uh, and my second question is, uh, like in this sutta in particular, uh, there's not much about mindfulness in meditation. There is just one line which says, mm. to concentrate. Very true. So what is the reason? Because it's, these are lay people. I mean, we're talking about total strangers to, to Buddhism, eh, to the Buddha Dharma. So the Buddha is giving them the first teaching. I'm sure the Buddha comes again, or maybe later on the Buddha will give deeper teaching, especially maybe some smaller group will come along and ask the Buddha, can you teach us some things, some meditation? But this is just the first, the opening teaching. And also you find there are people who need this teaching, even today. They want to know what is the introduction, what is the basic practice for lay people. Uh, they're not ready to meditate, so this is the one. So. Uh, the three jewels is for like recollection. You reflect, you feel joyful. So that is a kind of mindfulness practice. But even then, it will bring stream winning. Notice, so you don't need deep meditation for stream winning. You need some kind of wise faith, reflection on impermanence, constant reflection on impermanence. Okay? Okay, um, thank you, brother, for your question. Thank you, Brother Pia. Uh, we move on to the next question in the chat um, from Grace Lim. She asks, how does a Buddhist come to terms with the LGBTQ community in terms of the third mm. percent? Okay, uh, any kind of violation of anyone, okay, whether even children, is wrong. Okay, especially when the person says no and the person is already married or what do you call that, a bestowed to someone else, engaged to someone else. Basically, when the person is, says no and uh, unwilling, that is wrong. In other words, we should not violate the person of another. We should respect the person of another. Okay. So, when it comes to all these gay people and all the other uh, a range of those people, uh, as long as they respect this kind of understanding, they are not breaking the precept. It is wrong when they violate the other person. There is n nothing in the sutta says that for lay people, uh, how you should relate to each other in terms of sexuality, except for respect, respecting children, respecting uh, those who are protected by parents. You know, in other words, they, they're still not ready for marriage. Uh, those which are wards of the state, in other words, they're still going through some legal procedures and so on. Uh, people who are engaged to others to be married. Uh, of course, people who are married okay, to each other. So this idea of respect for the body is there. Well, we'll, actually, <laughs> the interesting thing is this idea of sexuality different category of sexuality is a modern idea. So we have created this problem for ourselves, you know, so it, it was not a problem with the Buddhists. So there's something we need to consider also. All right? Okay. Thank you, Brother Pia. Uh, next question from Ho C W. Um, I thought to attain stream winning, Sotapanna, the lower three factors must be broken. How does this tie back to this Sutta? Oh yes, definitely. I'm happy to hear that. There are a lot, some teachings are not mentioned here. Of course, this is, uh, you might say, implicit. All right? In, the Buddha says, it is possible for you to attain streamlining by this kind of practice. Remember, the word is wise faith. The, the, the Buddha always says things very carefully. So if you examine, the Buddha will say, okay, I said wise faith, and he will explain wise faith. So. If you look at wise faith, all the three factors are broken there, or, or can be broken to understanding the meaning of wise faith. First, if you have wise faith, 
you will not be looking at yourself and say, oh, I am this, I am that, you will not be narcissistic, you will not identify with your body, self-identity view is broken. If you have wise faith, then you won't have doubts about the, the way the three jewels are described here because they are meant for practice and reflection. If you have wise faith, then you won't be looking for answers through rituals and vows. In other words, through looking for answers outside of yourself. That's called superstition, basically. So it is implicitly, um, it is implicit in this sutta, in other words. Because as I said, this sutta is meant to be kept short and simple. Then later on, there are other teachings which supplement these teachings. Okay, but it's good that you are aware of it. So because you know the other suttas, you find that, oh yeah, this is, seems to be missing. Then you see a connection there. And that's, this is very important. This is what the sutta does to us. The sutta makes us question and say, okay, uh, what about this? And you begin to see the bigger connection there. So you have the explicit teaching, the implicit teachings. Sometimes uh, the Buddha doesn't mention that because he doesn't want to make it too long. Then this poor villagers say, oh my goodness, this is a difficult uh, teaching to practice, you know. So the Buddha is giving just enough, and this is only the beginning. I'm sure the Buddha is going to teach some more, and more people will come and ask him uh, some deeper questions, and, and some will even become monks and nuns, right? Okay. Thank you, Barapia. Um, the next question from Tio. The question is, why are there why are there all these seven virtuous qualities here as compared to the ten in Sariyaka Sutta? Ah. Does it mean, sorry, uh, and the next question follows, does it mean the three wholesome karma relating to the mind is mm. not uh, important in becoming a stream winner? Oh, no, 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 not at all. Remember, whenever you read a sutta, it's a little a keyhole or a small window you look through into the garden and you see just that part, you know, but it doesn't mean the other parts are missing. It's there, we've got to look out a bit more, right? So remember, this is a little cameo given to the Velu Dwara villages, right? So it's not the Buddha is giving a complete uh, teaching of everything there is. Ne? Here, I say comprehensive in the sense that you can start with this, right? So the Buddha gives the sila samadhi aspect first, the moral virtue and the, a bit of mindfulness aspect, uh, and, and uh, part of the seven of the ten uh, right, what they call the right course of conduct, eh, or, or the kusala kamapata. Right, but it's a very good question. It shows that you you know have studied the sutta, so you know the Salaka sutta. So you. Later on, you find that it's good to study the Salaka Sutta also. And don't be surprised in a way that the Buddha would also teach the people of Veludwara later on on the ten wholesome causes of karma. So it's a good question, yes. So remember, implicit teaching, okay? The Buddha is only beginning, giving them a, a kind of the first taste of the Dhamma. Okay, go on, please. Yeah, thank you, Barapia. Um, I think there's no more questions so far. Um, anyone else has any questions? Please feel free to ask or you can type in the chat. Okay, as so I said, sometimes it's the time I can answer some previous unanswered questions too, <laughs> if the listener. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, previous unanswered question. Yeah, I mean time anyone can ask too. Yes. I mean, if anyone you find the previous questions that was asked not answered, you can ask again now, you know. I think today's uh, teaching was very clear. <laughs> oh, we have one, we have one question from Rachel. Is the hell world on earth? She asked. Oh, the hell, the hells, is it? Hmm. Oh, interesting. There was a time when the ancient Indians actually believed it was below Rajagaha because there was this hot water lake. <laughs> so they said there was a hellfire down there. And there was a time when lots of people on earth believed that, you know, earth is down, uh, I mean, hell is down there. Uh, but the suttas don't mention it that way. In fact, when we, we look at the suttas, the last sutta in this series is hell we mentioned. I'm, I'm quite dreadful, dread, uh, dread to teach that sutta, but there are some very good teachings there on the Deva Dutta Sutta. I put it this way hell is a suffering state, state, okay? 
it's not exactly a place we go to. Some teachers, scholars, or may disagree with me, of course, you say where there are actually places. I, I can say that uh, this is my current understanding. I may be wrong, but all those very scare, very frightening descriptions of the different health states are actually found in the tortures of the kings of those days. So the, what the Buddha was trying to do is to show that what suffering can be and what worse way than to bring up the way the kings torture their enemies and, and criminals and so on. And really dreadful, very painful. So, in other words, we may not actually go through those exact torture mentioned, but the pain that we go through because we do bad karma is very real. Remember, what we construct in our mind is more real than what is out there. So if we create lots of bad karma, this karma act on us with fear and terror and pain. And we feel that the hellish state is very real inside us, despite what is described in the suttas. So the suttas are just what is called uh, pariyaya, in other words, a metaphorical way of showing us this is what pain is like, this is what hellish suffering is like. So it's not exactly a location in that sense. It is inside us, we carry wherever we go with us when we create bad karma, so to speak. Okay? Okay, uh, thank you, Barapia. Uh, do you still have time to answer one more question? But this is from the previous uh, yes, lesson. Yes, sure. please, yes. Okay, it's uh, from Brother Love. He asks, mm. have you come across any person who were awakened by just hearing the suttas in real life? What was special about the Agi Hotas that they got awakened by listening to a sermon? Uh, well, to answer your question, no, I've not met anyone who, who is awakened. Uh, only what the suttas have said. But I would certainly <coughs> agree that when people listen, like today, some people as they listen to the sutta exposition, they say, oh, now it's so clear to me. You know, so you can you can see this kind of uh, opening up in your own mind, you see, and that's what's important to us. You know, the, the point is this, uh, even if we, if you and I were to meet an arahat today, number one, we would not know that. Okay. Number two, suppose that uh, we really think this person is an arahat, what, we, what would we do? You'd be quite surprised. You know? The first thing I think is that the, the papers will come to interview him, right? And ask all kinds of questions. <laughs> but uh, the, the point is, many of us, I don't know, I, I hope we will say, okay, can you teach me Dharma? teach me meditation and so on, that I'll be awakened. That would be the most wonderful thing to ask. Okay? So, we don't know. Of right? course, there are stories you hear in the books. You say, oh, the, the teacher is the one who is awakened, is an arahat and so on. But I would say this is hearsay. And it is not important whether the, uh, you know an arahat or not, whether your teacher is an arahat or not. Important is your own practice. Because even if your teacher is an arahat, you can declare around and say, oh, my teacher is an arahat, but it might be a burden to you, it might be a fetter to you, that you will never be even a stream winner because of that pride. So it doesn't really matter. What matters is our own practice. Once you attain those various levels, if you are a stream winner, then you will know another stream winner. If you are an arahat, then you will know an arahat. That's the time. Uh, it's just like, you know, in the, in the academic world, the, the scholars will know when someone else speaks whether he has attained that level of scholarship or not, right? So something like that. So our practice is what really matters, not speculation, okay? Hey, thank you, Brother Pia. Uh, maybe we can take one last question. Sure. Yeah. Also from Brother Love, he mm -hmm. asks, can one practice jhana as a married lay person? How to cultivate it? Okay, no, no, that's a tricky one. Of course, the, the basic answer is you can, but then something will happen to you, okay? See, because the thing about jhana is uh, you rise above your body 
you rise above the limits of your body. So you will not have any more interest in sex. So be warned, okay? If you are married and you take up jhana, so you find the story of uh, Mahakashapa and his wife, Bada Kapilani. Uh, they, they decide not to have sex at all, you know? Uh, because they already attained the past life, they had these jhana experiences and so and so on. So we must be prepared, all right. Of course, you, you may have to seek permission of your spouse and say, okay, you want to renounce, okay. So a simpler question would be, can a layman attain jhana? And I'll say yes. For example, in the case of uh, uh, Katikara, the potter, he, he became he attained. Jhana, he became a non-returner, even as a lay person. But he, he has to take care of his two blind parents, so he remained a lay person, he stayed home. He still made pots, but he didn't sell pots. This is an interesting thing, because as a non-returner, he's not interested in money. And this is a very good lesson for monks today, who worry about money, that uh, even as a layman, this Katikara, the non-returner, didn't want to have anything to do with money. He made pots, they left the pots, the, the prepared pots outside his house with a message take what you want and leave me something some food so that's how he support himself and he's able to support his family and he probably must be doing quite uh, quite a lot of pots that he's even able to support become the chief supporter of the Buddha at that time that's the Buddha Kashapa the Buddha before our time so even a layman can go that far right but I think when it comes to marriage, we, we should respect the marriage. So if you are married, okay, you, you try to practice, attain stream winning, or once return, that will bring you on the path to arahathood already. All right? So, or of course, if both of you want to renounce the world, that's beautiful, you do it together. So these are choices you have to make with mutual agreement and understanding. Okay? Okay, um, thank you, Brother Pia. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your questions. And um, thank you, Brother Pia, for the insightful explanation. Of course. We will end the, our lesson today and um, we'll pass to Brother Pia for the closing puja. Yes, okay. Thank you. All right, so once again, let us briefly reflect on this wonderful occasion. I don't think I've answered all the questions that you want to ask. And maybe even not satisfactorily, because especially we all have doubts of our own and we have further views. But this is where to start. We start somewhere. It's not the end. It's, it might be just the beginning, just like the way the Buddha taught the Velu Dwaraya Sutta. It's just the beginning. So keep your mind open. Keep on asking questions. And the best answers are that you yourself will find at the right time. So keep on your practice meantime. As, accept Buddhism even in a provisional way. It is easier, it is better than other teachings because Buddhism gives you so much latitude, so much freedom. And today we have recited the precepts, we have done some meditation. These are all very good karma. And some of you also know a lot of suttas which will build up your wisdom. So recalling all this wonderful good karma, may we be well, may we be happy, may we be calm and wise to listen to more teachings and understand them. May we to share this joy and happiness with others. May our loved ones to be well and happy. May our enemies to be well and happy that they may become our friends in time to come. So reflecting in this way, send your loving kindness to all those people who matter to you. Dedicate merits to those who have passed away, if you like. And now let us close by reciting the closing salutations. Arahan Samma Sambuddho Bhagava Buddhang Bhagavantang Abhiwademi Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Bao Supatipanno Bhagavato Savakasango 
Sanghang namami ba. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you very much, Baron Pia. Thank you everyone for participating in today's lesson. Um, hope to see you all again next uh, lesson. And uh, please do not leave. Uh, I'll pass the session to Brother Joel. Yeah, wait, just, uh, just one minute, please. One, oh, one, oh, okay. okay. So next sutta will be Vitaka Santana Sutta. It's a very good sutta on meditation. So I'm just informing you ahead to, to make sure you keep a date with us.